Hi, Grandma here reading The Hiding Place, and I'm going to uh, be reading Chapter 14 today, The Blue Sweater. Now, if you'll recall, that sweater was one that um, their sister, Nolly, had, and um, it was a special sweater. It had embroidery, I think, on it, flowers. <clears throat> so it must play a pretty significant part in this uh, chapter. Uh, it's also the sweater that they put under um, the uh, uniform that uh, Betsy wore to keep her warm. In the morning, a cold, wet mist hung over the Lagerstrasse. I was grateful that Betsy did not have to stand outside. All day, the blanketing fog hung over Robinsbrook, an eerie day when sound was muffled and the sun never rose. I was on potato detail, one of a crew hauling baskets of potatoes to long trenches to be covered with dirt against the freezing weather ahead. I was glad of the hard physical work that drove some of the damp from my bones and for the occasional bite of raw potato when guards were not watching. Next, when the white Paul still lay over the camp, my loneliness for Betsy became too much to bear. Now, if you recall, Betsy is in a hospital. As soon as roll call was dismissed, I did a desperate thing. Mien had told me a way to get to the hospital without passing the guard post inside the door. The latrine at the rear, she said, had a very large window, too warped to close tight. Since no visiting was permitted in the hospital, relatives of patients often took this way of getting in. In the dense fog, it was easy to get to the window unseen. I hoisted myself through it, then clapped my hand to my nose against the stinging odor. A row of lidless, doorless toilets stretched along one wall in the pool of their overflow. I dashed for the door, then stopped, my flesh crawling. Against this opposite wall, a dozen naked corpses lay side by side on their backs. Some of the eyes were open and seemed to stare unblinkingly at the ceiling. I was standing there, lead-footed with horror, when two men pushed through the door, carrying a sheet-wrapped bundle between them. They did not even glance at me, and I realized they took me for a patient. I ducked round them into the hall and stood a moment, stomach nodding with the sight I had seen. After a while, I started aimlessly off to the left. The hospital was a maze of halls and doors. Already, I was not sure of the way back to the latrine. What if the potato crew left before I got back? And then a corridor looked familiar. I hurried, almost running from door to door. At last, the ward where I had left Betsy. No hospital personnel was in sight. I walked eagerly down the aisles of cots, looking from face to face. Corey! Betsy was sitting up in a cot near the window. She looked stronger, eyes bright, a touch of color in her sunken cheeks. No nurse or doctor had seen her yet, she said, but the chance to lie still and stay indoors was already making a difference. Three days afterward, Betsy returned to Barracks 28. She still had received no examination or medicine of any kind, and her forehead felt feverish to my touch, but the joy of having her back outweighed my anxiety. Best of all, as a result of her hospitalization, she was giving a permanent assignment to the knitting brigade. The woman we had seen the very first day seated about the tables in the center room. This work was reserved for the weakest prisoners and now overflowed into the dormitories as well. Those working in the sleeping rooms <clears throat> received far less supervision than those at the tables, and Betsy found herself with most of the day in which to minister to those around her. She was a lightning knitter who completed her quota of socks long before noon. She kept our Bible with her and spent hours each day reading aloud from it, moving from platform to platform. One evening, I got back to the barracks late from the wood-gathering foray outside the walls. A light snow lay on the ground, and it was hard to find the sticks and twigs with such a small stove was kept going in each room. Betsy was waiting for me, as always, so that we could wait through the food line together. 
Her eyes were twinkling. You look extraordinarily pleased with yourself, I told her. You know, we've never understood why we had so much freedom in the big room. She said, well, I found out. That afternoon, she said, there'd been confusion in her knitting group about sock sizes, and they'd asked the supervisor to come and settle it. But she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door, and neither would the guards. And you know why? Can you guess why? Well, we'll find out. Betsy could not keep the triumph from her voice. Because of the fleas. That's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas. My mind rushed back to our first hour in this place. I remember Betsy's bowed head, remembered her thanking God for creatures I could see no use for. Though Betsy was now spared heavy outdoor labor, she still had to stand the twice daily roll call. As December temperatures fell, the roll calls became true endurance tests, and many did not survive. One dark morning when ice was forming a halo around each street lamp, a feeble-minded girl two rows ahead of us suddenly soiled herself. A guard brushed at her, swinging her thick leather crop while the girl shrieked in pain and terror. It was always more terrible when one of those innocents was beaten. Still, the Alf Zayarin continued to whip her. It was the guard we had nicknamed the snake because of the shiny dress she wore. I could see it now beneath her long wool cape, glittering in the light of the lamp as she raised her arm. I was grateful when the screaming girl at last lay in the cinder street. Betsy, I whispered when the snake was far enough away. What can we do with these people? Afterward, I mean, can't we make a home for them or care for them and love them? Corey, I pray every day that we will be allowed to do this to show them love is greater. And it wasn't until I was gathering twigs later in the morning that I realized that I had been thinking of the feeble-minded and Betsy of the persecutors. Several days later, my entire work crew was ordered to the hospital for medical inspection. I dropped my dress into the pile just inside the door and joined the file of naked women. Ahead of us, <clears throat> to my surprise, a doctor was using a stethoscope with all the deliberateness of a real examination. What is this for? I whispered to the woman ahead of me. Transport inspection, she hissed back, not moving her head. Munitions work. Transport? But they couldn't. They mustn't send me away. Dear God, don't let them take me away from Betsy. But to my terror, I passed one station after another, heart, lungs, scalp, throat, and still I was in line. Many were pulled out along the way, but those who remained looked hardly stronger. Swollen stomachs, hollow chests, spindly legs, how desperate for manpower Germany must be. I halted before a woman in a soiled white coat. She turned me around to face a chart on the wall her hand cold on my bare shoulder. Read the lowest line you can. I can't seem to read any of them. Lord, forgive me. Just the top letter, the big E. The top letter was an F. The woman seemed to see me for the first time. You can see better than that. Do you want to be rejected? At Robinsbrook, munitions transport was considered a privilege. Food and living conditions in the factories were said to be far better than here at the camp. Oh, yes, doctor, my sister's here at Robinsbrook. She's not well, I can't leave her. The doctor sat down at her table, scrawled something on a piece of paper. Come back tomorrow to be fitted for glasses. Catching up to the line, I unfolded the small blue slip of paper. Prisoner 66730 was instructed to report for an optical fitting at 6.30 the following morning. 6.30 was the time of the transport convoys were loaded. And so, as the huge vans rumbled down Lagerstrasse the next day, 
I was standing in a corridor of the hospital waiting my turn at the eye clinic. The young man in charge was perhaps a qualified eye doctor, but his entire equipment convic consisted of a box of framed glasses, from gold rim bifocals to plastic framed child's pair. I found none that fitted, and at last was ordered back to my world work detail. Where do you think they got those glasses? I think the glasses are used, and they are from um, patients and prisoners who have died. But of course, I had no work assignment having been marked down for transport. I walked back uncertainly toward bar Barracks 28. I stepped into the center room. The supervisor looked up over the heads of the knitting crew. Number, she said. I gave it. She wrote it in a black covered book. Pick up your yarn and a pattern sheet, she went on. You'll have to find a place on one of the beds. There's no room here. And she turned back to the pile of finished socks on the table. I stood blinking in the center of the room, then grabbed a skein of the dark gray wool. I dashed through the dormitory door and thus began the closest, most joyous weeks of all the time in Robinsbrook. Side by side in the sanctuary of God's fleas, Betsy and I ministered the word of God to all in the room. We sat by deathbeds that became doorways to heaven. We watched women who had lost everything grow rich in hope. The knitters of Barracks 28 became the praying heart of the vast diseased body that was Robinsbrook. Interceding for all the camp, guards under Betsy's prodding, as well as prisoners, we prayed beyond the concrete walls for the healing of Germany, of Europe, of the world, as Mama had once done from the prison of a crippled body. And as we prayed, God spoke to us about the world after the war. It was extraordinary. In this place where whistles and loudspeakers took the place of decisions, God asked us what we were going to do in the years ahead. Betsy was always very clear about the answer for her and me. We were to have a house, a large one, much larger than Baye, to which people who had been damaged by concentration camp life would come until they felt ready to live again. Oh, it's such a beautiful house, Corey. The floors are all inlaid wood with statues set in the walls and a broad staircase sweeping down and gardens, gardens all around where they can plant flowers. It will do them such good, Corey, to care for the flowers. I would stare at Betsy in amazement as she talked about these things. She spoke always as though she were describing things that she saw as if that wide, winding staircase and those bright gardens were reality. This cramped and filthy barracks, the dream. I'm going to stop for now, and I'll finish reading the next section later.